Listen, if you're here, if you're here, if you're a member of our church, we are givers. We have determined that the word of God is true. So without manipulation, without anybody pressuring us, because we understand that God says that he loves a cheerful giver, because we have an understanding that Jesus said that if you give, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Because we have a good understanding that the scripture tells us that the sower will always have seed to sow. We are we because we understand what the scripture says, and we have a practical knowledge that it costs to do ministry work, that Jesus Christ is free, but it costs to do ministry work, then we are consistent tithers and consistent givers. So I want to thank my church for their faithful giving. Uh, most of you know you can give through Cash App at number four dollar sign SOFI, uh, number four dollar, uh, uh, dollar sign number four SOFI, or you can give through our website at www. S O F I N T L dot org. There's a giving button there. And even I think if you're watching through Boxcast, there's a giving button there. So be sure to give your, your giving. If you're uh, not from our church and if, if our messages have been blessing you, then sow a seed. Uh, everything starts with a seed. Just sow a small seed and let that seed come back and increase for you. Again, thank you so much for joining us. We're here. On, two, on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. And then we're here, here again on Sundays at 11.30. So join us on each night. Amen. Now, I got a pretty good message tonight. Uh, I really feel strong in my heart about it. So I just want to get started with it. So if you got a Bible, I'm going to use my phone tonight. So if you have a Bible, I want you to grab it. And we make a confession of faith. Our confession of faith just reminds us what God said about us. It reminds us, we'll get it deep in our heart, and it also reminds the devil. The, the God already knows what he said. So it's not for God, it's for us and the devil. So repeat after me. This is my Bible. It's God speaking to me. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Today, I will be taught the uncompromised word of God. I boldly confess, I am a doer, not just a hearer. I am above and not beneath. I am the lender. I am the lender. I am the lender and not the borrower. I am the head and not the tail. I am the victor. I am the victor. Say it like you mean it. I am the victor. I am the victor and not the victim. I can do all things. I can do all things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And there is nothing, absolutely nothing, the devil can do about it. Now shout hallelujah, amen, amen. Listen. I have been teaching a series of lessons that I have called the power of expectation. The power of expectation. Because Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us that now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So we know that hope is an essential element of faith. Because faith is what, faith gives hope substance. But we also know that Bible hope is not like worldly hope. Worldly hope is more of a wish and a dream. Uh, I wish somebody would call me. I wish this was happening. I wish I would get a check in the mail. That's more, that's more of a wish and a dream, but that's not really Bible hope. Bible hope is an earnest expectation that God is going to do what he said. God says something, and I have an earnest expectation that God is going to do what he said. So for the last few weeks, we've been, we've been talking about having this earnest expectation, putting pressure on our faith to expect God to do what he said. I said last week, God expects us to expect him to do what he said. Now, he, you can't expect him to do what you say it, but you can't expect him to do what he said. So expectation 
is an element of hope. And, and without faith, it's impossible to please God. So our faith and our hope is necessary to have the things of God. Now, here's what I have discovered. What happens when you lose hope? Because if faith is the substance of things hoped for, then what is it if you have no hope? How can faith give substance when there is no hope, when there is no earnest expectation that God can change your situation? And that's kind of what I want to talk about for the next few lessons. Because what I have discovered is that a person can lose hope and not even know it. They can be walking completely outside of hope and not even realize it. I recently saw a Facebook post that my daughter Elizabeth did and, and, and it just really struck me. And I mean, I don't know, for, for some reason, I read that post and, and it just struck me. I, I'm gonna read what, what it said. Now, I don't know if it was hers or she got it from somewhere else, but here's what it said. It said, if you stay too long in a bad situation, you'll forget it's bad and get comfortable while the best years of your life just pass you by. And when I read that, when I saw that on Facebook, it, it, it hit a chord in my heart. Uh, it reminded me of, of things that I have read in the Bible, and particularly it reminded me about this story at, at, at the of the man at the pool of Bethesda. So I went back through my notes from years ago and, and I went searching, I went digging up that story because that so reminded me someone who has stayed in the situation so long that they forgot that it was bad and got comfortable in that situation while their life was just passing by. I don't know if that's you or who I'm talking to, but I guess I'm calling this lesson tonight is do you need to make a move? Is it time for you to make a move? So let's look at this story about this man at the pool of Bethesda. Turn to John chapter five, verse two in your Bible. John chapter five, verse two. I'm gonna read the whole thing. It's a little bit long, but I'm gonna read the whole thing because we need all of it and then we'll come back and discuss it. So John chapter five, verse two. It says now, now, now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick, blind, lame, par and paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel would come down at a certain time into the pool and stir up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Verse five, now a certain man was there who had an infirmity for 38 years. Look at this man now. He's had an infirmity for 38 years. So when Jesus saw him laying there, he knew that he had already been in that condition a long time. He said to him, do you want to make, be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. And that day was the Sabbath day. Now, I find this to just be an amazing story. There's so much packed into this story that it, it, it tells me a lot about people who are stuck in situation. It tells me a lot to think about uh, when you can easily get into a situation and hope gets stolen away from you. Because this man had been there for quite a long time. So, Let's, let's look at what are the elements of, this, of the story. First, there's a pool in Bethesda. Around this pool, and kind of picture it. 
around this pool, around this like little lake or around this little, what I, I can see kind of a, a ditch or a swimming pool kind of size and a natural, but around this thing, there are five porches or, or, or five bays or five recesses. Now, each one of the five recesses are full of sick people. Some sick, some blind, some lame, some paralyzed. They all hanging around in these different, these different little areas, in, in these different bays or these different recesses. Now, at a certain time, an angel comes and stirs the water. I mean, I guess comes in and the water starts to bubble or kind of use your imagination. I don't know what the water does. It doesn't tell us what the water does, but the water gets stirred up. And then everybody knows the first one that gets in the water when it's stirred up, that person will get healed. Everybody else will have to wait till the next time. So Jesus comes now. And he sees this man who has been there, the Bible say, for a long time. The scripture says he had, he had the infirmity 38 years. So I don't know if he'd been there for 38 years or he'd just been there for many years, but it said that he'd been there a long time. So Jesus asks the man if he wants to be made whole or do he want to be healed? Then the man begins to tell Jesus about his problem that, well, I would like to, but every time I get ready to go, you know, somebody else go first and, and you know, and I, and, and I just can't get there to get my heel and I just can't get out of this situation because every time I get ready to get out of this situation, somebody else gets out of it first. So then Jesus ignores what the man is saying and Jesus said, okay, be healed, take up your bed and walk. Man, that's amazing. So let, let, let's, let's kind of see what we can learn from this story, uh, what we can see. Uh, uh, I kind of see this man's situation as a good example of some people's condition in life. Uh, that we know some people who, their, their condition is mostly described by this man's situation as we go through it. This man has gotten comfortable in a bad situation, so much so that he has forgotten that he's in a bad situation and he's there at the pool and his life is passing him by. So let's look at the elements because if you kind of break down the elements, it'll help us study this. We're gonna be doing this up for about three or four weeks. Okay, first of all, let's look at the pool. To me, the, the pool kind of represents the man's environment. I mean, it, I mean, the, the pool is the environment that the man is, is, is it's in. Uh, it could be a neighborhood, it could be an apartment complex, it could be a group of people, it could even be a church of people. I mean, we'll take the pool and it'll represent the man's environment. In that environment, uh, everybody is looking for the, some unrealistic thing to meet their needs. See, because in, in, in that environment around the pool, everybody's looking for the pool to stir. And then when the pool stirs, it's gonna, it's gonna meet your needs. It's kind of like everybody around the apartment complex, everybody waiting to hit the lottery, everybody trying to hit the, did you play the lottery? Everybody playing the number, because everybody waiting that if, if, if when I hit the number, it's going gonna, it's gonna to meet my needs. Or everybody trying to get government checks, and, and everybody think that if we get enough government checks, or, or we can find a way to get this kind of check, or get this kind of check, if we find just enough way to get a government check, then, then it's going to meet our needs, and we're going to get out of this situation some people just got to hustle you know they got to hustle call it whatever you want we call it a street hustle they got a street hustle and 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 everybody in their little group they got a street hustle uh you know they sell t-shirts uh uh they go to, to the to the department store and sell whatever they can take out you know you know what i mean uh so they got to hustle so so they depend on that hustle uh to meet their needs whatever it is everybody is there depending on some unrealistic thing to meet 
their need. And they've been mostly, they've been doing this for a long time and it hasn't met their needs yet. See, cause, cause the pool haven't met everybody's needs. So then, but people still there expecting the pool to meet their needs, probably encouraging one another. They're probably in a group of people in an environment that all of them bad and all of them sick, all of them got situations. They're probably encouraging one another, but everybody know the pool can't meet everybody's needs. And the pool just every now and then meet somebody's needs. Then we got the porches, okay? So what the Bible says is there's five porches, okay? And and to me, the five porches represents the uh, the different kinds of situations and conditions and places that people gather together to discuss the problems of life. And, and, you know, it, it mentioned in the story that, that in these porches was blind and these porches was paralyzed and these porches was sick. So I can kind of see that all the blind people was over in porch number two. All the sick people was in porch number three. That, that cause people like to be together, like to hang out with folk just like them. So everybody with the same condition, they hung out together. Uh, kind of like everybody with the same kind of hustle. You know, they hang out together. They, they got the same kind of hustle. They all hang out together. They all kind of hustle together, but the hustle not meeting their need. So they all hanging out together, but their needs not being met, but they probably all having fun with one another. Then there's the people that, that, that are at the pools. The people represent the group that's around the pool expecting that source to move them out of their condition, expecting a pool is going to do something. They have the same expectations and mostly the same disappointments because the pool never help everybody. It only help one person at a time and you don't even know when that's going to happen. But so then the pool, the, the angels stir the pool, everybody kind of rushed to get in the pool. One person gets in, did everybody else go back to waiting again, you know. Uh, kind of like the lottery. That's that, that's really the way the lottery works. Uh, they got the lottery kind of set up that you know you play the you play the three four cut or whatever you play it and, and you get a little bit of money. You tell everybody, well, you only one got a little bit of money. Everybody else play more, but everybody else gonna lose. So so they give just enough for you to stay involved and to get others involved. Then and, and then in the midst of all of this, we got this paralyzed man laying on his path. Uh, he, to me, he represents the people that find themselves stuck in a condition seemingly with little hope of moving out of that condition. Now, often the person, see, I think the man on the, on the, on the, the, the paralyzed man, I'm not sure he realized that he had given up hope of really having his needs met at the pool, at the pool. Now I say that because he gave Jesus this excuse, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, that well, every time somebody come, somebody else get in first. Uh, so that's why I'm here. Well, if some, if everybody come and somebody else get in first because you can't get there, well, why are you still there? So does he really think that the pool is going to meet his? need. It's, you know, kind of like somebody stuck in a relationship that's not going anywhere. Been in it for years and it's not going anywhere, but just kind of, kind of stuck there. It's not getting any better. Sometimes it get worse, but certainly it's not going anywhere. Just, just stuck there or, or, or stuck in a job that, that, well, you don't like the job. You complain about it. You hate going there, uh, but you just kind of kind of stuck you I mean you, you've been doing it so long that you forgot how bad you hate it and you're not really believing you know I don't really have an expectation that you can have something better uh, stuck in, in, in any situation that well you stuck and you've been in the situation for a long time and really if you examine yourself you don't have a hope of things getting better Amen. Okay, I know this is hard, but you'll get through it. Amen. All right. Then, but, 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 gotta understand, there's a problem at the pool. 
uh, which I put in my notes, there's a major problem at the pool. No one knows when the water's gonna move, first of all. No one knows. So everybody's gotta wait until the water moves, so you gotta be watching. I, I don't think a horn blew or anything, I just think the water started, started, blow, the water started moving. And so once the water started moving, the water is only able to meet a limited need. That limited need is for one person. So we don't know how many people were there, but the, but the story tells us there was a whole lot of people there. And so, but of all the people there, all the blind people, all the sick people, all the paralyzed people, all the people gathered around the five porches, when the pool stirs up, only one person's knees going to get met. So you can think that there's probably was some conflict around the pool. I, I, I could just see it. I could just see them around the pool and, and I, and I kind of visualize it in my mind that everybody's talking, somebody probably selling, somebody selling pickles, somebody selling hot dogs, uh, everybody having fun, they're playing cards over there, uh, everybody friends, till that water starts stirring. And once that water start moving, it's probably every man for himself. They probably start knocking over people, uh, knocking people down, everybody rushing, trying to get in until one person get in. Then one person, that person get in, everybody go back to what they were doing. They go back to playing cards, go back to, you know, shooting pool or, or whatever they're doing. They, they go back to doing that. Uh, so, so in the midst of this, there's a problem because that pool is never going to meet everybody's needs. Then the man is laying on a pallet. The Bible says Jesus come, he comes, he sees the man laying on a pallet. So the pallet is the thing that, that the man has connected him to. And since he's been there for a long time, we can assume that he's made the pallet comfortable for himself. Got him a little drink thing on the side, a food table, table on this side. Got, 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 got the right kind of covers around it. Cause he, cause, I mean, that, that's where he is all the time. So you can assume that, that he's made it comfortable because he's been there for a long time. The problem is that he's made it so comfortable that he's forgotten that, hey, this ain't gonna never get any better. And while he's there comfortable on a pallet, his life is passing by day by day by day. What pallet have some of us got on that we've made comfortable for ourselves? And we really don't think they're gonna get any better but we just make it day by day, and you never get back tomorrow. Every day that you that go is a day that's gone. Life is passing you by. That's this man condition. He's been there 38 years, or he's had the condition 38 years, and he's been at a place that won't likely meet his needs for a long time, but he's still there, and he's probably gotten comfortable there. Then Jesus comes with the power. Jesus comes with the power to change everything around the pool. And we don't know why Jesus chose that man of all the sick people. We don't know why Jesus chose him. But Jesus says, listen, you've been in a bad place. You've gotten comfortable, but you can have something different. Look away from the pool and look at me. I mean, that's amazing. All that time, that man's been looking at that pool, and Jesus said, you've been looking in the wrong place for your deliverance. You've been looking in the wrong place for your healing. You've been looking at the wrong place to move yourself for the next level. You've been, moving, you've been looking at the wrong place to get yourself out of this situation. So, all right, let, let, me, let me move on. So when Jesus is there, he asks the man this question, which seems on the surface like, why are you asking that? So Jesus said to the man, do you want to be made well? Well, that seems a little bit unusual because the guy's been there for 38 years. I mean, and he just said, well, you know, why you think I'm here? Basically, I would say, why you think I'm here? Uh, so you would, why does Jesus even ask him that question? Do you want to be made whole? 
And it's, it's kind of the question that I would ask you or anyone else that's been stuck in a situation. Do you really want to get out of that situation? Do you really want to get out? And, and why, is, why is Jesus answering that question? Asking. Asking that question. Because sometimes people don't really want what they say they want, what they indicate that they want. Often, we can want more for someone than they want for themselves. And it's only your faith that moves you to the next level. It's only your faith that will move you out of your situation. So Jesus needs the man to start thinking about, okay, do you really want to be here? Is this really what you want? Is this really the best you could have? So when Jesus asks the man that, the man falls back to what has made him comfortable with staying there. So then in verse 7, the man says, Sir, he says to Jesus, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Now, actually, this is a excuse for the man's condition. He said, well, I'm in this condition because when the water gets stirred up, I don't have anybody to help me and other people get by. Uh, it's not my fault. It's somebody else's fault. Uh, it could be that he has become so comfortable in his current condition that, well, he knows that when the water stirs, he's not going to be able to get there. He knows that he don't really have the help that he needs to be there, but yet he's still there. And we have to all ask ourselves, what is our excuse for our stagnant situation. Even in the midst of COVID, even in the midst of the challenges that we're going through, this is a time where it's easy to get, to get stuck in a stagnant situation. What excuses are you telling yourself? Are you telling yourself, well, if only my mother or father would have been there, if only my mother or father would have helped me, if they would have gave me some money or sent me to a school. I mean, is that an excuse to tell yourself why you should stay in that situation? Uh, or are you telling yourself, well, well, they just won't give me the right job. Uh, I, I'm, too, I'm too old or I'm too black. I'm not smart enough. I, uh, I just can't get the right job. Well, God has given everybody a skill. All of us have a, have a talent. Uh, and one, one friend that we know, I'm not going to call her name, but, but I'm so impressed that uh, the talent that she found herself with in a, in a bad situation, she found herself able to take her life and put it on YouTube and start doing a story about her life. And that began to pay her. I mean, it was just just simple thing like, okay, here's what I'm doing. Nothing fancy. Did. Probably you probably use the cell phone, but telling her story on YouTube and got thousands and thousands of followers, and that's paying her. So, so the job is not really an excuse. Are you telling myself that, that my husband or or my wife won't support me, and, and and that's the reason why I'm stuck in this, or or it's my education, or or it's my income, or whatever you're telling yourself that keeps you from moving out of that situation. Because we're all children of God, then we belong to the God of the universe. He always has best for us. Hebrews 6, 9 says this, but beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation. So because there's more to your salvation than just going to heaven. The going to heaven is enough. I mean, that, that'd be great, but there's more to your salvation than just the by and by. It says, though we speak in this manner, for God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have saw, shown towards his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience receive the promise. So when Jesus asked the question, do you want to be made whole? 
Jesus saying, is it time for you to make a change? Is it time for you to make a change? Is it time for you to move out of your current situation into something better? If for you the answer is yes, then you got to give up your excuses. You got to get up off of your pallet. You got to begin to grow your faith. You got to fix your eyes on Jesus Christ. The scripture tells us that God knows that the plans that he has for you, plans to do us good and not evil, to bring us to an expected or a prosperous end. God wants you to have his best, but God can't do it alone. He needs your permission and your participation. So over the next few lessons, I think through on Sunday and over the next few lessons, we're going to be talking about, is it time to make a move? Is it time to make a move? And what do you need to do to get out of that, your current situation? We're going to use this man at the pool, going to, going to examine closely what, what he was involved in. We're going to use it so that we can capture the principles and apply them to our lives. If you know somebody who needs this word, then you need to send them a copy of it, uh, have them tune in on Sunday, let them know, I got a word that you need to hear, and the word just might be for you. Amen? Amen. I believe that you receive it, that you're going to walk in it in Jesus' name. Now, Father, I just thank you for the word. I thank you that the word is true and just. We desire to be more than just hearers of the word, but to also be doers. Listen, if you've heard this for the first time, you begin your, you begin your new walk by giving your life to Jesus Christ. All you need to do is make Jesus the Lord of your life. The Bible tells us that we will confess him as Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead. We will be saved. So all you need to do is say this simple prayer. Jesus, come into my life. I turn from my path and I turn towards you. I believe that you died on the cross just for me. And on the third day, the power of God raised you up. I accept you as my Lord and as my Savior. Amen. Now, if you said that prayer, a wonderful thing happened. God sent his spirit into your spirit, crying out, Abba, Father. And you actually became a child of God. Now get yourself into a Bible-believing church. Get yourself around some, some people who believe like you. Get equally yoked. Uh, go around some folks who can help you grow. Continue to watch me here on Wednesday nights and on Sundays. If you're in Kansas City, come, when we go back to lab services, come and visit us at 9301 East 87th Street. If this lesson has been a blessing to you, then send me a comment, hit the like button, sign up so you can be notified whenever we're online. Uh, your feedback encourages me. I spend hours getting ready to give you this word. So, so your feedback encourages me, encourages your pastor. So we need to hear from you. So send us a message. Message If you have a question, hit the like button. If you have a question, then you can, you can uh, send me a private message through Facebook messages and I'll be glad to have answer that message or even pray for you God bless you let's watch the debate uh, everybody vote I'm not telling you who to vote for but to vote the price for you to have the right to vote was too high for you to waste it so get out and vote whatever your conviction tells you to vote. God bless you, and we'll see you here on Sunday at 1130. Amen? Amen.